So question 6 then, from paper 2 of the 2021 National 5 resource paper, it is the statistics question where you've got mean and standard deviation. So this is the one that usually appears in paper 2 because that's normally the calculator, whereas that corresponding one for measures of average and spread, the median and the semi quartile range would appear in the paper 1. So, it's a standard question. You work out, it says, work out the mean and standard deviation of this set of numbers, which represents the number of bus passengers on a certain Monday, on, a, on the buses, and then the second part is compare it to some other time. So that means you're comparing the mean and you're comparing the standard deviation. And the critical thing there is you have to show that you understand what they actually mean. Well, for four marks, mean and standard deviation. You don't need to set them out in a particular order. I just think it's easier if you put your X's, the X's will be the original numbers, in numerical order. So I've got two 20s there, 27, 29, and then out of the 30s, it just goes all the way, doesn't it? 31, 32, 33, and 34. So this will be by table. If you add these up, then you'll be able to work out the mean. Because the mean is the sum of all these numbers, so that's sigma x, divided by how many there are. Now there's six of them. n equals, oh, not a very good n there, is it? n equals six. So this is going to be something divided by six. So you add these up so you can put them into your calculator, although they're actually fairly good because they pair off, don't they? You've got 10, 26, so it's two over. So there's a six, so there's that's actually six, that's 18, because there was six threes there. So you need this total, that's the total that would go sigma x, but you just put it in your calculator. That's 186, and that divides in exactly, look, 31. So the mean's 31. So that was the first mark, get the mean. Add up those numbers and divide by six. Now the standard deviation, how much do they deviate? So for this column, I'm going to put x, those numbers. How far are they away from the mean? That's the deviation. And the handy thing about this is that it gives you a nice simple little pattern, especially with a 31. Oh, there's a thing, though, of course. Because that turned out to be a nice little number, this is actually the formula I'm going to use, the x minus x bar, because those will just be simple figures. If x wasn't a nice little number, if it was some horrible decimal, I wouldn't really want to use this. I wouldn't want to use that formula. So I wouldn't be using this formula here for the standard deviation with the x minus x bar net, because that'd be nasty. That's the purpose of this other one. I'd only have one more column here, and that would be with x squared in it, because this is the formula you use when you've got a nasty mean. But that's not. That's a nice mean. Well, that'd be quite nice, because 31, because that's one that's zero. So that one there, that's two short, and that's three short, and that's one more, two more, three more. One little check with this is, and then it's a handy check, because as soon as you look at that and think, because that should add up to zero, I don't know why I put that there, that's actually two away from that, that's four below, that's a wee mess. They should add up to zero, so that was a handy check there. That's that check in action. And then the formula wants you to have the deviation squared. So you just square them again. You don't need a calculator, don't need a calculator for this, because they're easy to square. 16, 4, 0, 1, 4, 9. And you need this sum. You need the sum. You'll see that in the formula. The sum of the squares of the deviations. But again, that's an easy one. Look, because you've got 20, 34. But best use your calculator to be sure after that. We carry on. Then you put down the formula. So it's going to be the square root of... Now, you could copy it all down. This over n minus 1, or you could just go straight in. So it'll be whatever that adds up to, which was 34, over n minus 1, one less than that, so that's a 5. Now I've gone ahead, there was one mark, because where do you, there's, there's possible of marks all over the place. There was one mark actually forgetting this, the answers of these squares that you're going to add up to put into the formula. And there was a mark for writing down the formula for the standard deviation and putting in the correct figures, the 34 upon 5. And the last mark's just for pressing the buttons. So you press the button, you know what's going to happen when you press the button. It's going to still come up with square roots, so you have to do the change to decimal. And you've got 2.607 and so on. Now at that point, you want to just check, because you know that in part B you're going to be comparing them. So 
I want this to be in the same form as the part B one. And here the standard deviation is 3.2, one decimal place. So here I'm going to put it down as 2.6. So it's also got one decimal place. And that's the last mark. And if for some reason you wanted to use that other formula, it's going to take an awful lot longer and you shouldn't really do that unless you're forced into it because it means some nasty decimal, which means squaring those decimals would be just as bad as, well, squaring the differences would be just as bad as squaring these numbers. But if it's not, then don't do that. Because here I've got to square these numbers, which is a lot, it's going to take a lot longer, and then also add them up to get the sum of those squares, because that's the part you need here. So that was a pest, having to do all that. It took as long as it would have done to do the whole thing the sensible way in the first place. Unless, you, unless some of them were easy enough for you to know the answer without having to resort to your calculator, but probably not. Look, there's a 32 there, 2 to the 5, square that, and that'll be 2 to the 10. You might know that 2 to the 10 is, starts with a 10. That's, something, that's one you tend to remember. 2 to the 10 is just over the 1,000. 10, 24. Now I've got to add them. So presume that I've done that correctly. I get 5, 8, 0, 0. And also, this, there's no check. Remember the other one? There was a check with that middle column. They should have added to zero and that spotted that little mistake I made. Now I've got to feed that into this. I'm just doing this just to say, don't do it! Right, so I've got to put in the sum of the squares. Well, I've got that. That's 5,800 minus. Now I need to square this number. So that's square the sum of the x's. That's 186 squared over how many numbers there are, which is 6, it's just n, and then divide it by 5. So if you did that, the first mark was for the mean, you'd have got one mark after you went through all of this. The next mark was for putting it into that formula, and then the final mark would be for hopefully getting the same answer. Even typing it in is a pest with the square root and the fraction, and the fraction inside the fraction. And then, of course, you get the same thing. But you get the same answer, obviously, because it's the same thing. But you just wouldn't do that. Unless you were forced to, because the mean was a nasty decimal. So when you found the difference between the value and the mean, you ended up with a number of figures you'd probably have to round off, which would be just as bad as doing this. So that would be neater. Now in part B, for two marks, this is the one that's called the writing in it, it says the mean number of passengers the following Saturday, so this is a different set of six numbers here, had a mean of 28. So I'll need to distinguish between them. So that was, I'll call it M for Monday and S for Saturday, and it had a standard deviation of 3.2. So again, I'll distinguish them, M for Monday, S for Saturday. Make two valid comments comparing the number of passengers on Monday to the following Saturday. Well, all you've got to do is explain what those actually mean. What is that a measure of? And what is that a measure of? So you've just to know that that's a measure of the average and that's a measure of the spread. So your two sentences will compare the average using the word average in it. And the, this part would compare the standard deviation using the words either spread or consistency. So the first sentence could be something like this, where you can see, on Monday, on average, there were more passengers per bus. So that's who you would write down. On Monday, there were more passengers on average. It used to be you'd have to justify that as, and then show that you know which of them is a measure of the average. So it's this one, as the 31 is greater than the 28. I don't see a mention of putting that into your answer to get that mark. And same again, what happens on for the standard deviation? Well, on Monday, they were more consistent. The numbers were tighter together. Or you could say on Saturday, but I'll stick for the, on the Monday. So if I want it from the perspective of the Monday, they were more consistent. From the perspective of the Saturday, they were more spread out. On Monday, the number of passengers was more consistent. And again, I'm going to put a comparison showing I know which numbers tell me this, as 2.6 is less than 3.2. So that's just like an example of what you need to do. The main thing is you've got to mention average, that these numbers tell you the average, 
and that these numbers tell you the consistency or the spread. Number seven then, for four marks, a scaling triangle. So this will be the cosine rule or the sine rule. What does it say? A fishing boat, that'll be the F, fishing boat. And a yacht, there's the Y for the yacht. Harbour, H, or the, an N for north. A fishing boat travelled 3.4 kilometres, so it's going along here, three, on a bearing. Now a bearing is the angle from north clockwise. So it's this angle here, that's 047, because I always write it down with three figures. So that's just, that just means basically that's 47 degrees. And the yacht travelled 5.7 on a bearing, that's the angle from north clockwise. So this angle right round to here is 115 degrees. I'll put it out here actually, because I want the angle in this bit here. Now what does it say? Calculate the distance between, you have to find the distance between them. I will just call that D, even though it's got a name, you could call it small h. Or you could call it FY, but I'm just going to call it D. Right, calculate the distance for four marks. Well, this is the cosine rule. You can get one angle in here, I can get this angle, because it's going to be the difference between them. It'll be 115, take away 47. So this angle in here is going to be 68. As soon as you see that configuration, two sides in the included angle, you know it's the cosine rule. You look up the front, you'll see this. A squared is B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cos A. You see, the significance of the cosine rule is quite easy to understand. It's Pythagoras. It's the general case of Pythagoras. If that angle was a right angle, it would just be Pythagoras. So this is the case where it's not a right angle. Or you could say Pythagoras is a specific case of the cosine rule. But I'll just put it in inverted commas because I've not got any A's, B's or C's. Now you could write down, right, I want this. So I've got H squared equals f squared and so on, but you don't need to. You can just go straight in because you can see the configuration. There's the two sides with the included angle. That's what appears over here. That's the one on its own. So you can just say d squared equals, and then it'll be squared and add the two sides, just like Pythagoras. So 3.4 squared plus 5.7 squared. But here's the difference now. If you like, it's the correction for the fact that it's not a right angle. 2 times 3.4 times 5.7, cosine of the angle in between. Just made it. Now there were four marks here. The first mark was for getting that angle. Just subtract the two bearings because you need that angle You're inside the triangle. You don't want angles outside the triangle. You want angles inside the triangle to do calculations inside the triangle. And the other mark was just for putting into the cosine rule. So it didn't matter what you wrote down as long as this calculation appeared. So you could have written h squared equals f squared and y squared, etc. to begin with, but it wouldn't have mattered. You wouldn't have got the mark until you actually wrote this down. Now it's just a case of calculate it. Notice, first of all, it will be the square, so this isn't the final answer. So you put it into your calculator, you press the button, and you've got 29.5302 and so on. Now it's up to you. You could, you could round that off and then enter the rounded off figure into your square root because the next answer, the next part is going to be to get the answer I just want to do the square root of this. But the thing is I'm not going to press equals in between having done it there and doing the final answer so as long as you don't press equals that answer is stored in that mem that answer memory and that's it that's it completely accurate. So I'm just going to transfer that in 29.53 and so on. That implies I've kept it accurate. You could have rounded it off. I'd have probably rounded it off. I've probably have had four figures there. Now just I can just press square root, shift square root, and just use the answer because that's completely accurate. And then I'll get it 5.434, and I can have as much as, as I like. But to keep it consistent with the information that I'm given, I'm just going to go for the first two figures. So 5.4 kilometers would be the distance between them. So getting that 29, the answer to that calculation was worth a mark, and the final answer is the final mark. So what difference would it have made if you'd done 29.5, for instance, because that's got one more figure than just noticing you want two in your answer. 
then I would just go back to that calculation and I'd put in 29.5 and I would get 5.43 so it would still round off to the same thing 